Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the legendary Dominarian team-up, Yargol and Multani. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see which commander we'll be covering next, who won last week's poll, and what commander you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Yargle and Multani are an 18-6 frog spirit elemental that costs 3 double black and a green that have no abilities. Breaking down their core stats, Yargol and Multani are sporting a heavyweight CMC, average toughness for their cost, and the highest base power out of any creature in the game that's legal to play, which goes a long way to make up for their lack of abilities. So, as we can see, while Yargol and Multani lack any mechanical abilities for us to make use of, what they do bring to the table is a gigantic power stat that puts even the most powerful Eldrazi to shame. As such, the question then becomes, how do we best take advantage of this huge power? And while yes, we can simply strap auras and equipment to them and call it a day in a Voltron-style build, since they're only 3 power away from one-shotting our opponents, I ultimately decided to take this build in a direction that emphasizes on generating huge amounts of value and board presence for us, while inflicting equally large amounts of life loss to our opponents via weaponizing Yargle and Multani's massive 18 power instead. On the value side of things, we'll be running a draw suite consisting almost entirely of draw cards equal to creatures' power effects, each of which will net us a whopping 18 cards when used alongside our commander to ensure that our hands are constantly overflowing with cards. So many cards in fact that we'll also need to run various means to remove our maximum hand size limit to ensure we don't have to discard down to hand size by the end of the turn, which we'll hopefully hit as we're tearing through our deck with our draw effects. Then to build up our board presence, we'll have a multitude of effects that allow us to turn Yargol and Multani's 18 power into extra bodies on the battlefield, whether that be through them just existing and or cracking in with their massive stat block, or instead sacking them away to flood the board with 18-18 worth of stats in their place or more. And then to weaponize our commander's power, we'll be running a variety of effects that turn our commander's high power into life loss for our opponents, most of which will require us to sack our commander to use, but we'll make up for that by running a suite of cheap on-death reanimation effects to bring Yargol and Multani right back into play to be used again, ensuring our commander's massive power will always be at our disposal to flatten our opponents with. So let us make our way to Dominaria, where the fused Yargle and Multani are hard at work consuming the invading Phyrexian forces. To Yargle, this invasion is a grand buffet, a never-ending stream of bodies for him to feast upon to satiate his ravenous hunger. To Multani, however, this battle has quickly become a bid to prevent the glistening oil from completing Yargle, with him using his magics to purify the infectious toxins as quickly as Yargle consumes them. But regardless of their reasons for fighting, together they wield the power of Urborg and Yabamaya with devastating efficiency, turning the might of nature itself against Dominaria's invaders until they're reduced to little more than scraps of metal, flesh, and oil for Yargol to consume. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Jumping straight into the CMC2 slot, we have its singular entrant, Sakura Tribe Elder, a 1-1 that we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, making it the first of many land ramp sources we'll be running in this build to help us get to our CMC6 commander as quickly as possible. The CMC3 slot then brings us another lone entrant in the form of Eternal Witness, a 2-1 that, when it ETBs, lets us return a card from our graveyard back to hand, providing us with an easy way to recycle any of the resources we'll be using to weaponize our commander's power and or keep them alive so we can get extra uses out of them, of which we'll be running plenty. Then moving on to the CMC4 slot, we'll open with a pair of legendary sack outlets, Shadow Heart, Dark Justicar, and Gerard, Golgari Lich Lord. Shadowheart is a 3-4 that lets us pay one, a black, tapper, and sack another creature to draw X cards, where X is the sacked creature's power, drawing us a staggering 18 cards off our commander when we sack them away, and working very nicely alongside our suite of on-death reanimation effects to bring Yargle and Multani right back into play as we use it. 
Gerard is a 2-2 that gains plus 1 plus 1 for each creature in our graveyard, lets us pay 1, a black, a green, and sack a creature to have each opponent lose life equal to the sacked creature's power, and lets us sacrifice a swamp and a forest to return him from our graveyard back to hand, who will be running in this build as a finisher who effectively flings our commander's 18 power into each of our opponent's faces, with a single activation almost bifurcating our opponent's life totals, and a second activation tending to end the game on the spot, which this build can easily do in a single turn to quickly close out games. We'll then be staying on the creature sacrificing game plan as we delve deeper into this slot with Disciple of Bolas and Ruthless Technomancer. Disciple of Bolas is a 2-1 that, when it ETBs, has a sack another creature to gain X life and draw X cards, where X is equal to that creature's power, making it a faster but one-time use Shadow Heart that still provides the same great draw power and tacks on 18 life gain as a bonus to help pad our life totals. Ruthless Technomancer is a 2-4 that, when it ETBs, has a sack a creature we control to create treasure tokens equal to its power, in addition to letting us pay 2, a black, and sack X artifacts to return a creature of power X or less from our graveyard to the battlefield, where X can't equal 0, which when used on our commander will generate us 18 treasures, 8 of which we can then use immediately to resummon them and leaving us with 10 treasures to do whatever we want with for an insane amount of ramp. Then moving away from sack outlets, we'll close out this lot with a trio of Green Entrance, Tanuki Transplanter, Timeless Witness, and Gore Claw Terror of Calcisma. Tanuki Transplanter is a 2-4 with Reconfigure 3 that, whenever it or the equipped creature attacks, it generates green mana equal to its power, and, until end of turn, we don't lose that mana as steps and phases end, resulting in a massive 18 green mana for us every time our commander swings in with it, which when followed up with our many draw equal to power spells allows us to cast quite a number of the spells we draw into immediately. Timeless Witness is a 2-1 with Eternal Eyes for 5 and double green that, when it ETBs, lets us return target card from our graveyard back to hand, serving as a slightly more expensive copy of Eternal Witness to recycle even more of our resources back to hand, with the upside that we can use it twice per game if we can get it into the bin via Eternal Eyes, which shouldn't be an issue in this build thanks to all our sack outlets. Goreclaw is a 4-3 that makes creature spells we control with 4 plus power cost 2 less to cast, and, whenever Goreclaw attacks, each creature we control with 4 plus power gains plus 1 plus 1 and trample until end of turn. The cost reduction this legendary bear provides helping us cut down on Yargle and Multani's massive mana cost on both the initial and subsequent castings, while the trample and stat bump they grant ensure that our commander damage gets through and hits even harder. Closing in on the end now, the CMC5 slot brings us our penultimate creature entries, Psychosis Crawler and Ghoul Caller Gisa. Psychosis Crawler is a star star whose power and toughness are equal to the number of cards we have in hand, and, whenever we draw a card, has each opponent lose one life, weaponizing our draw 18s by adding an 18 damage rider to them, and, even if our opponents survive that, it will then be at least an 18-18 beat stick that we can crack in with alongside our commander to finish them off. Gisa is a 3-4 that we can pay a black, tap, and sack another creature to create X 2-2 zombie creature tokens, where X is equal to the sacked creature's power, this time enabling us to turn Yargle and Multani's 18 power into 36-36 worth of stats on the board at flash speed, forcing our opponents to either wipe the board immediately or fall before our instant army of zombies. And finally, reaching the CMC6 slot and our last creature entry, we have Thunderfoot Bailoth, a 5-5 Trampler that, so long as we control our commander, gives itself and all other creatures we control plus 2 plus 2 and a Trample. Synergizing nicely with our various mass token creation effects to turn them into mid-sized trampling threats, and with our commander to again ensure they can get their damage in while bringing up their power to an even 20, just one point shy of one-shotting our opponents, which we can easily increase even further in this build through other means. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we'll open with the suite of On Death reanimation spells, Feign Death, Undying Malice, Undying Evil, Malakir Rebirth, and Supernatural Stamina. 
all of which, until end of turn, grant target creature, when this creature dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control, the first two returning it into play tapped with a plus one plus one counter, the third returning it back into play untapped with a plus one plus one counter if it didn't have one already thanks to granting it undying, the fourth also bringing the target back into play untapped but costing us two life to do this and giving us the option to play it as a black tap land instead, and the last granting the target plus two plus oh until end of turn and returning it back into play tapped all providing us with an incredibly cheap way to bring our commander right back into play as we sack them away for value or as our opponents attempt to remove them, and sometimes bringing them back even bigger to boot. The CMC2 slot then continues on the On Death reanimation game plan with its first four entrants, Demonic Gifts, Fake Your Own Death, Abnormal Endurance, and Return to Action, which again, until end of turn, returns target creature back into play under their owner's control if they would die, with the first three also granting the target plus two plus oh until end of turn, and returning it back into play untapped, tapped with the treasure token, and tapped respectively, and the last granting it plus one plus oh and lifelink until end of turn instead providing us with even more on death reanimation to ensure our commander remains on the battlefield no matter how many times we sack them away or our opponents attempt to remove them. Then moving away from reanimation and onto some removal options that take advantage of our commander's high power, we have Inscription of Abundance and Ram Through. Inscription of Abundance has Kicker for two and a green, and either has us choose one of the following effects, or all three instead if we kick it. Put two plus one plus one counters on target creature, target player gains X life, where X is the greatest power among creatures they control, and or target creature we control fights target creature we don't control, which we'll be primarily using as a fight effect to have Yargle and Multani deal with any troublesome creatures, but if we have the mana, we can also use it to permanently grow them and net ourselves 20 life for our trouble. Ram through has target creature we control deal damage equal to its power to target creature we don't control, and if our creature has trample, it deals any excess damage to that creature's controller, making it more than capable of destroying any creature on the battlefield when used in conjunction with our commander, and when coupled with our various ways of providing trample, inflicts a solid amount of burn as well. From there, we'll be adding in some more generic removal options to our arsenal, such as Go for the Throat and Power Word Kill, both of which destroy target creature, the former being limited to non-artifacts, while the latter's limited to non-angel, demon, devil, or dragon creatures instead, as well as Return to Nature and Wilt, both of which destroy target artifact or enchantment, with the former also giving us the option to exile target card from a graveyard, while the latter lets us cycle it for two, making them all cheap and efficient removal options to help us deal with both front row and back row threats. And then as our last entry in the CMC2 slot, we have Tend the Pests, which has a sacrifice a creature and then creates X 1-1 pest creature tokens that gain us one life when they die, where X is equal to the sacked creature's power providing us with another way to turn our commander into a swarm of bodies, which this time help pad our life totals as our opponents destroy them. It's then on to the CMC3 slot, which consists of removal options all the way down, those being Beast Within, which destroys target permanent and gives its controller a 3-3 to replace it, Hero's Downfall, which destroys target creature or planeswalker, Putrefy, which destroys target creature or artifact and prevents regeneration, and Crosin Grip, which destroys target artifact or enchantment and has split second. Wrapping up our removal suite with some more staple spot removal in our colors to help us deal with any type of threats our opponents throw our way. Nearly at the end now, the CMC4 slot brings us our second to last instant entry, Momentous Fall, which has a sacrifice a creature to draw cards equal to its power and gain life equal to its toughness, this time giving us a surprise way to draw 18 outside of our turn, which is handy to have in response to removal or wipes and doesn't force us to discard down until the turn gets back to us. And finally, reaching the CMC5 slot and our only remaining instant, we have Return of the Wild Speaker, which either has us draw cards equal to the greatest power among non-human creatures we control, or gives all non-human creatures we control plus three plus three until the end of the turn. Both its modes actually being very useful to us in this build by either serving as yet another flash speed draw 18, or as a combat trick we can use to get our commander to exactly 21 power and one shot on opponent if the opportunity presents itself. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. 
Skipping straight into the CMC2 slot, we begin with the Ramp Spells, Rampant Growth, Farseek, and Nature's Lore, all of which put a land from our deck into play, the first being limited to basics and putting it into play tapped, the second being limited to a land with a non-forest basic land type and also putting it into play tapped, and the last being limited to forests, all of which help us speed up and fix our mana base on the cheap to ensure we can get to our commander as quickly as possible. We'll then close out this slot with a pair of sack effects, Life's Legacy, and Rite of Consumption, both of which have a sack a creature to either draw cards equal to its power, or deal damage to target player equal to its power and gain that much life, respectively, giving us access to even more sack effects that turn our commander's 18 power into value or damage to further improve the build's consistency. It's then back to the ramp game plan as we enter the CMC3 slot with its first three entrants, Cultivate, Kodama's Reach, and Nissa's Pilgrimage, all of which have us search our deck for two lands and puts one into play tapped while sending the other to our hand, the first two being limited to basics and the last being limited to basic forests, but if we have two plus instants and or sorceries in our grave when we cast it, it lets us search our deck for three basic forests instead and puts two into our hand. Again, providing us with even more ramps so that we can reliably get Yargle and Multani on the board and begin using and abusing their power as soon as possible. Essence Harvest then wraps up our CMC3 slot, which has target player lose X life while we gain X life, where X is equal to the highest power among creatures we control, giving us a massive 36 point life swing for only 3 mana, and being one of the few ways we can turn our commander's power into damage without sacrificing them, freeing them up to be used to generate us extra value and damage through other means. Then proceeding to the CMC4 slot, we come to its pair of entries, Fungal Sprouting and Mandate of Abaddon. Fungal Sprouting creates X11 creature tokens, where X is equal to the greatest power among creatures we control, generating us 1818 worth of stats to further build up our board and not even having us sacrifice our commander to do so. Mandate of Abaddon has us choose target creature we control, then destroys all creatures with power less than the chosen creature's power, taking advantage of our low creature count and our commander's massive power to scour the board of all creatures of 17 power or less, which should be the whole board in most cases. And while this is a universe's beyond card, I would still personally recommend running it as a superb wipe in this build, but if you'd rather not, I do have a somewhat comparable alternative in the side grades. Closing in on the end now, the CMC5 slot brings us a trio of Green Powers Matters entries in the form of Monstrous Onslaught, Soul's Majesty, and Traverse the Outlands. Monstrous Onslaught deals X damage divided among any number of target creatures, where X is equal to the greatest power among creatures we control as we cast it. The 18 damage it doles out to any number of creatures, effectively making it a one-sided wipe in this build, and, unlike some of our other spells that check for power that our opponents can try and remove our commander in response to, this one checks for power as soon as it's cast, locking in that amount to prevent our opponent's removal from interfering with it. Soul's Majesty has us draw cards equal to the power of target creature we control, adding yet another entry to the dry teen pile to give us the greatest chance of hitting one throughout the course of the game and begin drowning our opponents with the huge amount of resources they net us. Traverse the Outlands has us put X basic lands from our deck into play tapped, where X is equal to the greatest power among creatures we control. Upon resolution getting us all the mana we'll ever need from that point forward, and almost ensuring that we'll be hitting nothing but gas for the remainder of the game. And at last, reaching the CMC6 slot and our ultimate sorcery entry, we have Rishkar's Expertise, which has us draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures we control, and then lets us cast a card of CMC5 or less without paying its mana cost, serving as yet another draw 18 in this build that tacks on a free spell after the draw, of which we'll have plenty to choose from after drawing about a fifth of our deck. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Opening with the CMC1 slot, we'll begin with the ramp spell Font of Fertility, which lets us pay one, a green, and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, effectively making it a Wayfarer's Bobble in our colors that we can drop on turn one, then use to speed up and fix our mana base on the following turn, which again helps us get to Yargle and Multani that much faster. We then have a pair of auras closing out this slot with Kaya's Ghost Form and Rancor. Kaya's Ghost Form enchants a creature or planeswalker we control, and, when it would die or would be put into exile, returns it back into play under its owner's control, serving as a proactive way for us to reanimate our commander, which, while slow, provides protection against exile-based removal as well, which would normally get around most of our other reanimation effects. 
Rancor enchants a creature, grants it plus two plus O oh and trample, and if Rancor would be sent to the graveyard from the battlefield, it returns to our hand. Increasing our commander's power to an even 20, granting them trample to get through blockers, and even returning to our hand to be used again if our commander's destroyed or sacked away, all for the cost of a single mana. From there, it's on to the CMC2 slot and its singular entry, Dying Wish, another aura that enchants a creature we control, and, when it dies, has target player lose X life while we gain X life, where X is equal to the enchanted creature's power, making it a solid payoff for all our sac effects to widen the gap between our and our opponent's life totals even further as we sack Yargul and Multani away for our other effects. The CMC3 slot then brings us yet another lone entry and aura, Demonic Embrace, which enchants a creature, grants it plus 3 plus 1, flying and the demon subtype, and lets us play it from the graveyard by paying 3 life and discarding a card in addition to its other costs. On its own, bringing our commander into one-shotting range and giving them evasion to boot, forcing any opponents without flying blockers to deal with them immediately or lose the game in a single swing, and even allowing us to play it from the bin to always have that looming threat at our disposal. And finally, reaching the CMC4 slot and our final enchantment entry, we have Greater Good, which lets us sack a creature to draw cards equal to its power, then discard three cards, serving as a free sack outlet for our commander that we can set up before they even come down, that we can use in response to removal, and that we can repeatedly use to draw 18 at the cost of pitching the worst three cards in our hand after the draw, which is well worth running to tear through our deck for even more resources. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Kicking off with the CMC1 slot, we have the pair of Ramp Sources Soul Ring and Wayfarer's Bobble joining us as its only members, the former tapping for two colorless and the latter letting us pay two, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, giving the build even more access to cheap ramp to ensure we can reliably get to our commander as fast as humanly possible. The ramp plan then continues into the CMC2 slot with its singular entry, Thought Vessel, which taps for a colorless and removes our maximum hand size limit, again helping us cheaply speed up our mana base, but more importantly, making it so that we don't have to discard down to 7 after using our multitude of draw 18 effects and waste resources. Similarly, the CMC3 slot adds the mana rock Decantra of Endless Water to our arsenal, which also removes our maximum hand size limit and this time taps for a mana of any color, providing us with further protection from having to discard down to hand size while it speeds up and fixes our mana base. We'll then wrap up the CMC3 slot along with the remainder of our artifacts with the trio of equipment, Loxodon Warhammer, Mask of Gristlebrand, and Scepter of Celebration. Loxodon Warhammer equips for 3 and grants the equipped creature plus 3 plus 0, Trample and Lifelink, bringing Yargle and Multani to exactly 21 power to force our opponents to block them or lose the game, and even if they do, the combination of Trample and Lifelink will still allow them to inflict a huge amount of commander damage while padding our life totals against any crackback coming our way. Mask of Gristlebrand also equips for 3, grants the equipped creature flying and lifelink, and, when it dies, lets us pay X life, where X is equal to the equipped creature's power, and, if we do, we draw X cards, this time granting our commander evasion to fly over blockers instead of crashing through them, while its lifelink granting helps us break even when paying for our commander's on death draw 18 with only a single swing. Scepter of Celebration equips for 3 as well, grants the equipped creature plus 2 plus 0 and trample, and whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, we create that many 1-1 creature tokens, providing us with yet another means for Yargul and Multani to reliably crash through blockers to deal their commander damage, and when they do, they'll spawn a horde of additional bodies for us to further grow our board state. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our Planeswalkers. Our lone Planeswalker entrant comes to us in the CMC5 slot, that being Garuk, Primal Hunter, who comes into play with three loyalty and has the following abilities. His plus one creates a 3-3 creature token, his minus three has a straw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures we control, and his minus six creates a 6-6 creature token for each land we control, making him at worst a sorcery speed draw 18 if we minus three him on the turn he comes down, which is still very serviceable, and if he does manage to stick around, provides our build with a steady stream of tokens to help screen attacks for us and or alpha strike with, which helps offset the low amount of creatures in the base build. 
That covers our singular planeswalker, so let's move on to our land base. Quickly running down our mana lands, we'll be running Command Tower, Lanawar Wastes, Necroblossom Snarl, and Tainted Wood as dual lands that come into play untapped to improve our consistency without sacrificing speed, Temple of Malady as a dual tap land that makes up for its low speed via its ETB Scry 1 to help smooth out our draws, Haunted Mire and Woodland Chasm as a pair of dual tap lands with basic land types, making them fetchable by our non-basic land ramp sources to further improve consistency, and lastly, Blighted Woodland and Myriad Landscape to give us one last bit of land ramp, this time from the land slot, to ensure we can get to our commander as quickly as possible. Then for our utility lands, we have Bajuga Bog, Rogue's Passage, and Reliquary Tower. Bajuga Bog comes into play tapped, taps for a black, and, when it ETBs, exiles target player's graveyard, providing our build with a silver bullet against graveyard-focused and reanimator-style decks, all from the convenience of our land slot. Rogue's Passage taps for a colorless and lets us pay for and tap it to make target creature unblockable until the end of the turn, granting us yet another way to make our commander evasive and ensure we can continually threaten our opponents via their massive commander damage output. Reliquary Tower also taps for a colorless and removes our maximum hand size limit, giving us one last way to prevent us from having to discard down to hand size due to our multitude of draw 18s and costing us no mana to do so, provided we haven't made a land drop for the turn. And finally, we'll be running 12 Swamps and 12 Forests as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 13 creatures including the Commander, 22 Instants, 15 Sorceries, 6 Enchantments, 7 Artifacts, 1 Planeswalker, and 36 Lands. Looking at the stats add matter to our game plan, we have 25 cards that care about creatures' power, 10 cards that turn power into draw, 4 cards that turn power into tokens, 5 cards that turn power into life loss or damage, 10 sources of on-death reanimation, 16 ways to increase our creatures' power, 8 ways to grant creatures trample or evasion, and 3 ways to remove our maximum hand size limit giving us plenty of ways to use Yargul and Multani's enormous 18 power to generate us a massive amount of card advantage, amass us a huge board presence, and inflict tons of damage to our opponent's life totals, alongside a solid number of ways to bring our commander right back into play on the cheap as they're either removed or we sack them away for value, various means to temporarily or permanently increase our commander's power to make all our power matters payoffs even more potent, several ways to make it easier for Yargul and Multani to get in for commander damage, and capping off off with a handful of ways to remove our maximum hand size limit to ensure not a single card we draw off our draw 18 spells go to waste. For general deck stats, we have 18 ramp sources, 10 card draw sources, 10 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes. Our ramp being very high in this build due to us needing to get to 6 mana as quickly as possible to cast our commander, while our draw spot removal and wipes all fall within more typical ranges. Then looking at our mana curve, we have 10 1 drops, 19 2 drops, 14 3 drops, 11 4 drops, 7 5 drops, and 3 6 drops, leaving us with a somewhat lighter midweight curve that aims to make a beeline for our commander as quickly as possible via our wide array of ramp spells, preferably while still having 1 or 2 mana open to protect them from removal with our on death reanimation spells if needed. And then, once we untap with them, we can use one of our many draw equal to power spells to draw 18 cards, hopefully hitting a hand size remover if we don't have one in play already, then use all our extra resources to weaponize Yargle and Multani's massive power via either turning them into a huge amount of board presence, commander damage, or burn, until our opponents are forced to bend the knee to our overwhelming might. Currently, this deck is valued at 6504, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can exchange out Fungal Sprouting for Indomitable Might if we want to have a guaranteed way to one-shot an opponent through commander damage at the cost of reducing our board presence. Thought Vessel can be traded out for Tainted Strike for some additional one-shot potential via Poison Counter distribution, though we'll likely have to discard more resources with our draw 18s, and Malakir Rebirth can be swapped out for Overwhelming Stampede, allowing us to turn our boards of 1-1s and 2-2s into 18-18 Tramplers alongside our commander, though it will reduce the number of times we can reanimate our commander in response to our opponent's removal or us sacking them away for value. 
And for those who'd rather not run Mandate of Abaddon, though I would personally recommend it as a near-perfect board wipe in this build, Culling Ritual is a somewhat comparable substitute that can clear the board of most rocks, small creatures and tokens, and other two mana or less permanents while gaining us a lot of mana that we can use to cast our commander as it does so. Then for upgrades, Return to Action can be cut for Journey to Eternity, which initially serves as an on-death reanimation source that we can precast on Yargle and Multani that, when they inevitably die or are sacked away for value, transforms into Atsul Cave of Eternity, which technically ramps us further as it turns into a land and then gives us the option to repeatedly reanimate our commander directly from our graveyard moving forward. A basic swamp can be terraformed into Shizo Death's storehouse to provide us with another way to grant our commander evasion while still generating black mana. Font of Fertility can be swapped out for three visits as a more efficient ramp spell that can fix our mana more easily by fetching up any of our forests, non-basic or otherwise. And Nissa's Pilgrimage can be axed to make room for Selvala Heart of the Wilds, who gives us some incidental card draw every time we cast or reanimate our commander, on top of netting us 17 green mana every turn to help us cast all the spells we'll be drawing. And finally, since the main goal of this build is to get Yargle and Multani out as quickly as possible, we can cut the decent ramp source Wayfarer's Bobble for the broken ramp source Jeweled Lotus, which allows us to get our commander on board as early as turn 3 to get our game plan rolling, speeding up our mana base as efficiently as it drains our bank accounts. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I would first like to give a quick thanks to all the channel subscribers for helping us crack the 12.3k subscriber milestone. Thank you all for the continued support you've shown the channel as we would not have gotten here without it. Now, with Yargle and Multani covered, the next commander we'll be covering will be one of the newly completed commanders from March of the Machine, namely the Phyrexianized Ayara Widow of the Realm, so stay tuned for a Sacrifice Heavy Reanimator build featuring her next week. Then moving on to the results of last week's poll, it looks like after a very close race, Jeru and Hazret were able to claim the top spot, so look forward to a legendary themed build featuring them coming soon. Then proceeding to this week's poll, with Aftermath having released just a bit ago, for better or for worse, I decided to open an extra slot in the next few polls to include entries from this set so we can cover them. As such, this week's poll will be a mixed bag of entrants consisting of the team-up pairing Hidetsugu and Kari, the Phyrexian Glissa Herald of Predation, the newly awakened Planeswalker Quintorius Loremaster, and the recently desparked walker Kiora Sovereign of the Deep. So please cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, before the deadline on June 2nd, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders from March of the Machine you want to see me cover in future polls. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I would like to thank Forrest for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Forrest, and thank you for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cutrate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.